we, we have to look at, okay, what are the keys to success? Um, again, when a patient asks me if they come to me after three months and they're like, hey, I'm eating so good. Am I one of your success stories? And I tell them yeah. to come back to me in five years. Come back to me in five years and tell me you're still eating good. Then you're a success. Success is not short term. It's being able to do something long term. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to yet another episode of I Love Being Sober. My name is Tim Westbrook, and I'm the CEO and founder of Camelback Recovery here in the always sunny and always sober Scottsdale, Arizona, where my team and I, over the course of many years, have helped thousands of people on their path to recovery. We started this show because there's so much misinformation about addiction treatment, mental illness, and recovery in general. There's so much more to to recovery than just going to inpatient treatment, seeing a therapist, and going to 12-step meetings. All of those things are important, and AA saved my life. However, to find long-term recovery and live happy, joyous, and free, there's a lot more to it than just stopping the drinking, stopping the drugs, stopping the sex addiction, or stopping any addictive behavior, for that matter. To live a new life, a person needs new, healthy lifestyle habits, amongst other things. Typically, this includes new eating habits, new exercise habits, new sleeping habits, new hobbies, new interests, new friends, self-care becomes a priority, and the list goes on. Those are the types of things that we talk about here on the show. And today, I'm here with Kristen Kirkpatrick, who is a senior fellow at the Meadows Behavioral Health and creator of their Fuel Well Nutrition Program. She is the lead dietitian and manager of the wellness nutrition services at the Cleveland Clinic. She is also a best-selling author, experienced presenter, and award-winning dietitian. She has also contributed to national publications, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Time, Runner's World, Oprah, Martha Stewart Living, Food Network, Women's Health, The Huffington Post, just to name a few. She's also on Dr. Oz's medical advisory board. Today, Kristen and I will talk about nutrition and wellness as it relates to addiction recovery. Kristen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so excited to be here because I just feel like the topic that you're covering is so important and you really hit the nail on the head. People see probably therapy in a vacuum and I it like just just change one thing. I know that's the way li- my patients look at nutrition. Just change one thing. And there's so much more we have to change. Right. Yeah. Just stop doing drugs. And, and people talk about, let me just, can I just take a pill to stop drinking? And right. it's like, man, right. it, recovery is so much more than that. And life can be so much better on the other side of recovery. But you got to do everything. Right. It's like um, baking a cake. You can't just bake a cake with one or two ingredients. Like you got to put all the ingredients in for the cake to come out and taste good. Right, right, right. And and I think like that's so important because what you said, you have to do some work to get on the other side. But I'm sure this is true, especially because you've lived it. And I know this is true because I've lived it from a nutrition perspective and then see patients. But man, if you can get to that other side, it's wonderful. Right. But you see, like, you know, a lot of my patients, it's just here's here's all the reasons I can't do it. Here's all the barriers. Here's the big wave that I can't get over. But, man, if you can get over that wave, you'd never go back to the other side of the ocean. Yeah. And it's it's hard to see what's on the other side. If you because you've never if you've never experienced it, if they've never experienced it, then they just don't even know it's possible. And- right. And one of the things that many people say in an AA meeting is, I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. And if you're a newcomer, I know when I was a newcomer, I'm like, what are they talking about? This is, this is a fate worse than death. I mean, it's like to be a grateful recovering alcoholic. And today I'm one of those people that says I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic because my life is amazing today and it wouldn't be the way it is today if I didn't go through what I went through. Right. Right. You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about in all my years of practice, what I, I, th- I like to think about what are the most like impactful statements that patients have made to me. And I think this has always remained at number one. I had a patient that I was actually helping with sugar addiction. So she didn't have a weight problem. And like, you know, on the outside, her life looked perfect and just a complete sugar addict. And we worked together for a very long amount of time. And on our last session when she finally felt like she got on the other end she said to me i never realized how bad i felt until i felt good 
And it was really interesting that like her her norm was feeling bad. Like she didn't think there was any other way to feel because she had been so used to feeling the one way for so many years that that's how people feel. And then she felt good and realized, oh, my gosh, I've wasted all these years feeling like crap. Yeah, you know, I had some uh, comprehensive blood work done back in December and, and I've had comprehensive blood work in the past, but I had this comprehensive blood work done in the, the doctor, Dr. Rebecca Miller said, you know, your thyroid's not functioning 100%. And I was like, okay, what does that mean? She said, well, you're probably kind of tired. And I was like, well, I feel okay. And to your point, that was my norm. Yeah. My norm was, my norm was I needed seven to eight hours. I needed eight hours of sleep and I wasn't totally alive. I wasn't totally awake. And, um, and she said, you watch in 90 days after I put you on this thyroid medication, you're going to feel a lot better. Sure enough, 90 days later, I'm going, man, I feel so much better. I have so much more energy. I need, I don't need as much sleep as I thought I needed. I mean, I really need like, like six hours of sleep. I don't need eight hours of sleep. It's, it's kind of crazy. So you're right. People get, they get used to living a certain way. They get used to feeling a certain way until they get to feel what it's like on the other side. And then once right. they're on the other side of it, they're like, oh my gosh, this is so much better. Right, right. Agree. Yeah. Agree. So what, what is an RDN? A registered dietitian nutritionist. And let me tell you why that designation changed by the academy and credentialing for, for registered dietitians years ago. This actually brings up a really interesting point. So most of consumers of the community, whoever you speak with, they see someone who will call themselves a nutritionist and then say, oh, great, you're a nutritionist. I'm going to go and see you. But really, legally, anyone can call themselves a nutritionist, whether you have training, whether you don't have training, whatever it is. To become a registered dietitian, you have to go through all the schooling and an internship and then sit for an exam and then keep up CEUs. So the academy changed it from registered dietitian to registered dietitian nutritionist because people were not recognizing the fact that every registered dietitian is also a nutritionist, but every nutritionist is not a registered dietitian. So that's why we changed the, the, the labeling of how we have our credentialing behind our names. Little fun fact. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's great because it's like, oh yeah, we have a nutrition expert on staff. Like, who's that? And how do you define expert, right? Like what I'm biased, mean? I'm biased, but I mean, <laughs> right. I know people that will say that they're like a wellness or nutrition expert and it's just because they've read a few books and that's the title they give. So, um, right. you know, if you want all the schooling and all, all, everything that comes along with it, especially I think when we get into, if you're looking at your population base, if you have people that are struggling with addiction and they also have type two diabetes, heart disease, renal <laughs> failure, that's really where a nutritionist is not going to be a nutritionist or, you know, however we want to look at that might not be as helpful because we're really delving more into the medical points of some of these things. So what gives you the right to claim you are an expert on nutrition and wellness, which we, we kind of just covered it a little bit. People but beyond the edge, yeah. beyond, beyond the education um, and be, beyond the credentialing and beyond all the other stuff that you already went through. Um, do you have anything else to add? I mean, there are some nutrition certification programs, but, you know, I think as a consumer, you do have to look very carefully. You have to look at, OK, what's the educational background um, and do I care about that? I mean, to be to speak quite frankly, you might spend less money on someone who just has a certification in nutrition than you might a registered dietitian. So there's all these things. And you also have to look at your overall goals and things like that. But I mean you know, what gives you the right? It's just like, wow, we could go down the rabbit hole on that one on a lot of different things today. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, that's, abso that's absolutely. The that gives you the right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. So now what specific incident inspired you to be so passionate about nutrition and wellness? Yeah. Where were you? What happened? Who were you with? Yeah. So for me, it was more about who I was, right? You used to be a different person um, before you were sober. I used to be a different person before I really changed my relationship with food. So as a teenager, I was obese. 
I went to my annual exam with my mom. Um, I had blood work done. My physician told my mom, well, it looks like she's like, you know, maybe insulin resistant. She's got to go see a dietitian to go lose weight. So I went to go see this dietitian and she was very nice. And here I walk in this obese kid, very unsure of themselves. And she was perfect by my means perfect body, per, everything was perfect, bubbly. And she said, well, what do you think you're doing wrong? And I said, oh, gosh, well, it's probably like, you know, I probably shouldn't like eat the cookies that I'm eating in the middle of the night. I do that. And then I overeat like here and here. And she's like, OK, well, let's start with this. Let's just stop eating the cookies in the middle of the night. And I realized I feel like at that young age, that's just like you said, you can't just take a drug and be fixed like this person didn't recognize the fact that I wasn't eating the cookies just to eat the cookies. There were much deep, me, deeper meanings why I was making the choice. And she didn't understand that we had to delve into those meanings before I could even change the habit. So I think behavior change is so critical and difficult. And diet is the one thing that is a non-negotiable. We can choose not to exercise. We can choose not to manage stress, but we can't choose not to eat because diet is associated with survival. Right. Over time, if you stop eating, you will die. Right. If you're in the forest and you have lack of food, you will die. Right. Yeah. And so I think like for me, it was more about the perspective of really I want to get into this because I feel like I can understand it. I can understand when someone who is, who is overweight or addicted to a food says to me, oh, my gosh, like I just I had a sleeve of Oreos last night. I mean, don't hate me. I had a sleeve of Oreos. And my answer back to them is like, no, don't hate yourself. That's a normal reaction to some stimulus that you had. You medicated with food. Let's get back to why you medicated with food to begin with. So, you know, what I what I hear when you um, you say your nutrition or the, the person you spoke with, she said, just stop eating Stop eating the Debbie's nutty bars. Right. That's what you said. That was you were right. addicted to these Debbie, Debbie's nutty nutty bars, right? Yeah. Little Debbie, Tim. Little, Little Debbie. De uh, okay. <laughs> Little Debbie nutty bars. Okay. What I think about is the people that are successful at staying clean and sober are the people that are focused on living a new life, not the people that are focused on stopping the drinking and stopping the drugs. Like, oh, I just can't have a drink today. I just can't shoot up today. I just can't smoke a cigarette today. And so it's the same thing with with food and nutrition. I just can't eat a cookie today. Right. I just right. can't eat a sleeve of donuts. If you're focused on not eating the sleeve of donuts, that's temporary. It's not sustainable. Would you agree right. with that? I totally agree with that. And I think like along the lines of what you were saying, um, when I'm seeing patients now, when they come in and let's and they tell me what their goal is. And for many of my patients, their goal is I want to feel better. I want better, better mental health, but still a huge chunk of my base is weight loss. Um, whatever the goal is, I always tell them that I need three whys on the motivations to do this. And only one of them can be vanity related and vanity is totally fine. We, we all want to look good in our clothes. I want to look better in my jeans, whatever the case may be. But two of them right. can be vanity related. So I want to not develop Alzheimer's like my mother did. I want to live longer than my siblings did. I want to get on the ground and play with my grandkids. So it's those motivating factors that we know is more likely to lead to sustainable action, right? Um, and I, again, you're the expert here, but I would assume the why is just as important so, yeah, I shouldn't drink so much. It's really ruining my relationships and it's ruining my health. But what's the why? What's the motivating factor that keeps you from drinking in 30 days, 60 days and 600 days? What is that why? So I think once we can identify the why, we've got a really good motivating factor of why we have to make that change to get to it. Does anyone not, not come up with a good enough why for you? Well, I mean... I, that's why I always give them the the gimme for the vanity, right? If your why is I just want to get back into my into my prom dress or my wedding dress, <laughs> right? I always give yeah, them that. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think we're all kind of we're all driven in different directions, and we're all really molded from where we started in our childhood in terms of food and what we were taught in our childhood. So I think um, I would never want to judge 
my why. Yeah. I think most people have whys that make sense to them. Um, so my role is to really support that, but to help them get over the finish line based on the rationale they gave me. If their why is a little bit BS, it will come out over time. Right. And I guess I didn't really want that that bad. Right. right. So I think like that's kind of like if, if it's not one that I think is good, I think that will be revealed by the patient and to the patient within a matter of days. Right. I think that's like BJ Fogg's um, behavior change model, motivation, ability and prompt. It's like, what's their level of motivation? Why are they motivated to change? And then their ability. How easy is it? to change the behavior. And maybe in the short run, the ability is a little bit easier. But then once they're triggered, once they're at an event, they're they're in an environment where there's lots of junk food, they're at a festival, they're at a fair or something like that, it gets a little bit harder. And if right. their motivation is not high, it's not high, high enough, there's no way that they're going to be able to stay on the path. Right. And I think that that speaks very well to like what we were discussing at the beginning of this talk, which is looking at that vacuum. Right. It's not just about stopping to eat something. Um, there was a study that came out in JAMA about two years ago, and the title of the study said that obesity and bad eating habits were contagious, that essentially where where you chose to kind of be. Um, could really impact your ability to be able to lose weight. Or if we don't even look at weight in this in this calculation, just talk about healthy eating. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think like if you are in an environment where healthy eating is not um, supported or condoned, of course, you're more likely to make bad decisions. If you're with people um, that aren't supporting that. And, and as you probably know, again, like we're talking about different things, but we're talking about the same thing. And that's behavior change. As you probably know, um, someone can tell you till they're blue in the face, like, of course, I support your efforts and I want you to eat healthier and I'm so happy for you. And then when you go out to dinner to be like, oh, one bite's not going to kill you. Right. Yeah. So it's like we have to look at those those places and kind of look at, OK, what's my circle? Who who is my tribe? And is my tribe truly supportive of me to help me reach that finish line? Right. I think it's. Uh you, you are the average of the five people that you're spend your, that you spend the most time with. Right. And I think that's, yeah. I think that's in every area, in every area, exercise, fitness, food, um, recovery, work, how much money you make. Like, I think that that, that rings true in all different areas for the most part. Yeah. 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 Can I um, steal and, that line in a future presentation, Tim? Cause I love it. It's all yours. Take it. Take it. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. So, and, and one of the things like in our homes, we provide all the food. And the reason we provide all the food is because environment is so important. And if I'm the one providing all the food and the food is all good, high quality, organic, whenever we can, we actually purchased another grass fed, grass finished, actually pasture raised cow. Um, based upon our last interview that we did, we talked about grass fed versus grass finished. And we, we purchased another cow from uh, a, a ranch up in Wickenburg and it's pasture raised. Awesome. So, yeah. Yeah. So so it's it's an amazing thing that we do. But if I provide the food as opposed to the standard sober living home or the average sober living home where most people buy their own food and you end up with a refrigerator full of hot pockets and frozen burritos and top ramen. And everybody steals each other's food. And, and that's, that's, a, that's, that's a huge problem, right? So, so I like to have some control over the environment, to your point. The, you know, the environment always wins, eventually. Yeah, the environment always wins. And I think that's why um, really what the Meadows did with Fuel Well is so groundbreaking um, in that they, they looked at what do we do really good and they do therapy and addiction really good and trauma really good. Um, and what can we improve? So I, you know, that's really where our relationship began. And now they do their food really good as well. So I think like we, we have to look at, okay, what are the keys to success? Um, again, when a patient asks me if they come to me after three months and they're like, hey, I'm eating so good. Am I one of your success stories? And I tell them yeah. to come back to me in five years. Come back to me in five years and tell me you're still eating good. Then you're a success. 
success is not short term. It's being able to do something long term. So I think for the Meadows to take the, the process of what they do in an amazing manner and then transfer it to now let's feed people in the right way is really incredible. So I, I commend you for saying, OK, where I am, I'm going to provide my food because if I don't, then there's no real credibility to you in having any conversation about diet, right? Like right. for you to tell people like, hey, it's really important that we get off of sugar and we start eating more nutrient dense and then like, OK, I'll see everyone at lunch and lunch is crap. Well, yeah. then who? no one's going to listen to you, right? Right. Exactly. I, I liked what you said about um, the, the patient that comes to you and says, I'm doing really well after, let's say, a year. Right. And your response is come back to me in five years. I remember when I when I celebrated five years of recovery from alcohol and drugs, people said, congratulations, you're no longer a newcomer. I was like, what? What yeah. are you talking about? I've been around forever. And I think it's with everything. It's it's five years. It takes five years. Come back to me five in five years. years. If yeah. you're still sober in five years, then we've got something to celebrate. I think the right. statistics are people that make it to one year um, of sobriety are, gosh, I, I forget the exact numbers. I think it's like 67% are going to make it to five years. And then people that make it to five years are 85% uh, 85% likely to stay sober for the rest of their lives. And I mean, I don't know how true that is, but I, they sound, they sound pretty good to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, it's such a, in, in some ways when you're in front of the five years, it could be so overwhelming, right? Like yeah. five years seems like forever. Right. But then it's kind of like, but then one year is not right. One year just flies by. And I think even, even to that, um, what's been really kind of a little bit concerning to me is looking at the people that have done great for five years plus, and then went back to a bad habit during the pandemic. So I think that has really changed things as well. Um, and I'm not even talking about weight. Yes, we have seen about a 30 pound average weight gain during the pandemic, but I'm talking about like, there's more processed foods being purchased. There's more food um, being consumed as a way to cope, as a way to manage stress. Um, and so that has increased. So it's like, I think that what that has taught me is that, yeah, you can be at five years and be awesome. And I'm so proud of you, but something major can really break even the most resilient patients. And I've seen that in the past 18 months while we've all gone through this together as a nation. Well, yeah. I mean, you've got the isolation, um, which is the opposite of human connection. And right. when people are isolated, they get triggered. Their depression and anxiety um, increases, which means that they're more likely. I mean, it just the result is that they're more likely to act out on food, sex, drugs, alcohol. Whatever. Right. Right. And that's happened. And we've seen Absolutely. it happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And we have surveys that have shown it, too. I mean, I just I remember um, this was early on, but I just remember when our governor said that he was going to um, close down the liquor stores. And I remember it, it turned out to be it was almost comical how this occurred. It turned out to be this kind of breaking news in the Denver area, looking at these people making a mad dash for the liquor stores, right. like the right. lines down the, down the, down the sidewalk. And then within a span of two hours, he reversed it. And he right. said, okay, okay, okay. We're not going to close down the liquor stores. But I mean, I was like, wow, like what a testament of human behavior in a, a time that was very stressful, obviously, but also full of a million different unknowns. We still have a lot of unknowns, but back then it was even more. Right. So I just feel like, gosh, what a, how interesting to see, the mindset of how people are reacting to this. Yep. So you started talking about the fuel well program. Let's, let's talk about the fuel well program you designed for the patients at the meadows, um, along with, I guess, uh, what diet is recommended for an addict early in recovery? Yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, for, for the Meadows Fuel Well program, our goal is really patients, visitors, and guests. Um, 
even though it was something I thought of, I'll tell you, they had an amazing team that I worked with, including their chefs, to be able to come up with how it actually is implemented. But I think when you look at what are kind of like the top foods that we know are associated in the field of nutritional psychiatry in relation to helping with addictive, uh, you know, addictive disorders, uh, trauma, things like that. Um, we really have to go more clinical and go back to the brain. So when we look at things like depression, for example, we know that there's inflammatory factors associated with impression, depression. And so if we can reduce inflammation, as we have seen in multiple studies, we can help with some of those factors and that can help with depression as well, amongst other things. So what are some of the biggies? I think getting more omega-3 fatty acids are really critical. Um, those are one of the main things that we've seen in terms of mental health outcomes and some of the trials that we've seen. So if someone is like, oh, I hate fish, that's not happening, then we can look at omega-3 supplementation. But I do think the marine base is really critical. So looking at um, EPA and DHA, which is what a salmon has within it, right? As opposed to ALA, L ALA is still great, alpha linoleic acid in the plants, walnuts, chia seed, things like that. But if I were to say, okay, here's my pie in the sky, I would go the marine base. So I think that's really critical. I think folate and vitamin D, yeah, go ahead. Well, hold on. on, on that note, so you said salmon. What about, what about other fish? Does it matter? Is, is, is salmon the best? What about halibut? What about, um, what about mackerel? What about trout? Yeah. What about tuna? Yeah. Yeah. So they're all great. They're all great. But let's just say that number one, you want to find um, fish that has low mercury. So how is mercury determined in a fish? The age and the size. Tuna is huge. And it's got a lot of surface area. So the more surface area you have on a fish, the more likely they can absorb more mercury, which is why tuna is a high mercury food, despite the fact that it also has omega-3 fatty acids. Um, the reason why things like sardines are so fabulous is because they're so tiny. You're going to get virtually no mercury. Wow. Right. Okay. Um, so there's okay. that component and it has omega-3 fatty acids. So I think from the omega-3 perspective, wild salmon, lake trout, um, small amounts of tuna. Right. Those are fine. Those are all really great options to think about sardines. A lot of people don't like sardines, but sardines are another great option. Um, and then when you're thinking of omega-3s, let's say, OK, if we get out of the fish world, which is obviously the marine base. Then we go back into that plant world. So walnuts, chia seed, flax seed, things like that. Um, if you look at the general dietary guidelines, the recommendation is probably about at least two servings of fatty fish a week. And a serving is probably like your fist, right? That's what a serving pretty much looks like. I think the most important components are low mercury and wild. So if you can get, if, if, if the thought process is, well, I really want the wild salmon, but I can't afford it because when it's fresh, it's really expensive. Then maybe you look at a canned version and determine, well, how do I utilize canned salmon within my diet? Now, speaking to mercury, let's say someone eats a can of tuna every single day. Like what's what, what potentially could happen with high amounts of mercury? Yeah, you can definitely get mercury toxicity. There's no doubt about that. Um, so, you know, I've, I've seen that probably not a huge amount of my patients, but I am in integrative medicine. So we, we do tend to see patients that are more likely to have things like heavy metal toxicity. Um, mercury would be one of them. And if you have too much mercury, of course, like that could affect your brain and that affects basically everything else. Right. So I think that that's just something to think about. I, I once had this patient. This is so interesting, but it speaks to the mercury. Um, just couldn't figure out what what was going on with this person's symptoms. Right. And we were thinking mercury because of the fact that it just went along with what we knew in the literature related to mercury toxicity and behavior. Um, but this guy had like no mercury in his diet. So what we later discovered was that he's a huge fisherman, constantly had the hook in his mouth while he was doing everything else to get the line and he was fishing daily. So the mercury was there, we were right, but it wasn't coming from diets. So the thing is, is that like, sometimes wow. you have to really go and look at, okay, like we really need an integrative or functional, I'm not a functional dietitian, I'm integrative, but a functional approach would also be warranted for things like that to kind of determine, okay, am I having too much? So um, we've definitely seen, I mean, I don't know if you remember, but I think it was Jer Jeremy Piven, I think, um, 
he, he was public about this. He had like this huge sushi habit. And then he was like, oh my gosh, like I found out that I have mercury toxicity. So I think with tuna, um, I think probably two servings a week is probably fine if you're pregnant less than that. Um, but I think we, you know, we can take that discussion of tuna and really relate it to other places. Like getting too much of anything is probably not a great idea, right? Like let's, let's eat real food and let's eat small amounts of it. Okay, so I, I'm sorry I cut you off. Where are we at? Where are we at next? You 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 were at you were at. Folate. Eating, I was yeah. at folate next. Yeah. So yeah, folate, folate. Okay, let's um, let's move on. Sorry. Okay, folate's going to be found in green uh, leafy greens. Um, it's also going to be found in beans and legumes. So I think like the folate discussion is really good because it gets to the discussion of gut microbiota. And we have found again in nutritional psychiatry that the gut is a huge driver of mental health. So if we have good gut microbiota which we know is determined by what we call microbial diversity, um, we're more likely to have better outcomes with mental health. So leafy greens are great for gut. Uh, beans and legumes are great for gut because of the fact that it's got fiber. So having a higher fiber diet is really impactful, as is having whole grains, things like that. You can find folate in that as well. Um, I think the one thing I brought up the last time I, I spoke on your show, and I definitely speak about it at the Meadows, is just kind of cautioning your your patients that you see, if they feel, oh, I have brain fog, things like that, to really consider doing a little bit of nutrigenomics testing to determine if they have what's called an MTHFR deficiency. If you have an MTHFR deficiency, which is genetic, um, it, it, it does not allow the process of folate to enter the brain. So MTHFR is like the chaperone that says, okay, I'll take you up through the blood brain barrier and we'll put all your folate up in the brain. And so what happens is folate enters to go to the brain and there's no chaperone. You don't have it. You have that deficiency. And then it's like, oh, what do I do? I guess I'll just go back. Right. So the thing is, is that when we have MTHFR deficiencies, for the most part, as a dietitian, I'm always recommending whole foods. We know that that is the most powerful, but with individuals with that certain genetic variants, we also have to look at what's called a methylated folate, which is a folate supplement with that methyl group or chaperone already attached. And that's over the counter. That is not a prescription, but it's definitely worth talking to your physician, whatever your patients are, to say, hey, I'm kind of thinking I want to get this MTHFR check to see if maybe if I have folate from leafy greens, it's great, but maybe it's going to be better if I get it through a methylated folate. How, how does a person know if they're gut microbiota is in good condition or in good working order. I don't know how, how you, how you well, clinically, you get a, question. yeah, clinically you get a poop test. That's clinically. <laughs> and it can okay. see kind of what your microorganisms look like. But I think for the most part, um, where we see associations with that is um, of course, heavy alcohol use will disrupt a good microbiota. So there's that. If you're tired, if you're stressed, I mean, there's so many things that can point to, okay, let's look at your gut health. Um, so what I tell my patients is, hey, you know what, instead of giving me a sample of your poop, why don't we just work towards a good, healthy microbiome? Because we know the science on how to do that, right? Um, and we can make it as simple as possible. We can look at components such as, let's just get more color in the diet. More color means you're eating more plants. It also means you're eating a diverse amount of plants. So that gives you more nutrients and things like that from that perspective. Um, I think it will be interesting to see if we have studies that will come out in the next few years, because one of the detriments of a good microbiome is excessive cleanliness. And though we have chilled out a little bit, you can't walk any place today without seeing five bottles of hand sanitizer at the cash register. So we are definitely hand sanitizing a lot more than usual, and that's taking away our good bacteria and our bad. And so it'd be interesting um, to see if we have data years from now to show, okay, you know, did that really help the gut microbiome? Obviously, we still need to do it. We, you know, we need to protect ourselves, but the gut microbiome has an impact on immunity as well. So I think, um, you know, just kind of looking at folate and those types of things, more fruits, more vegetables, looking at gut health, those are the main components. And then we can go to what I would call the negative aspects of conversation. So less sugar, less refined grains. If you can cut those two out of your diet, um, your microbiome is going to be so much healthier. Okay. So we've got salmon, uh, omega-3s, we've got folate, um, and then we've vitamin got D. 
foods, vitamin D. We've got foods with color, plants, veggies, so forth. What else? Um, so, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll mention vitamin D again, cause I didn't say it yet. Vitamin D, that's where you're definitely looking at a supplement. So for your patients, go and find out what your level is. Number one. Yeah, let, yes. You could go to target, get a vitamin D supplement. 2000 international units is probably going to be the norm uh, of the measurement. Ah, that's fine. But maybe you're not warranted for that. Maybe you need to take 5,000 international units a day to really get your levels up. So we know that vitamin D is very closely tied to depression. Um, so I always say, yeah, go go find out your levels. And then once you find out your levels, work with your physician or your dietitian to determine the dose. Right. And obviously, this also impacts um where you live. I'll never forget, Tim, I was doing a presentation in Scottsdale and I made a statement and I'm not from Scottsdale. And I was like, well, no one in this room probably has vitamin D deficiency. And they're like, no, we probably all do because we stay in the air condition all day. <laughs> right? Walk around Scottsdale in the summer. Nobody has a tan. I mean, the only people that have a tan are people that went somewhere else. Right, right, right. And so, ah. you know, for someone like me, I'm not from Arizona. Oh, that was a real eye opener. I just assume, hey, yeah. everyone's vitamin D here is great, right? Um, so really, I mean, the, the way we get vitamin D from food is very inefficient. It has to convert from um, a form that the body doesn't understand to a form the body does understand. And that's a very um, disjointed process. And so that's why you could eat salmon until you're blue in the face and you could be drinking bottles of cod liver oil. It probably won't have a huge impact on your vitamin D level. It's really just the UV rays of the sun. So because we don't want everyone hanging out with the UV rays, we go supplement on that route. So I think the last thing I would say with that is, again, have your patients work with their clinicians, wh whoever they're working with, to find a reputable brand, right? Um, branding in supplements, I think, is very important. And so sometimes you do get what you pay for. So getting something really high quality would be something I would look at as, as an important factor of that. Um, and I think those are the big ones. I mean, you could really, you and I could talk for an hour just about the gut and hit all those foods, Right. Mm -hmm. So it depends on yeah. where you look at it. And then obviously with 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 your gut microbiota, if we just look at the data, we do know that obese states typically lead to um, a negative gut microbiota. We know that stress can lead to a negative gut microbiota. So really, you know, poor microbiota. Um, people could consider doing things like taking probiotics, things like that, getting more fermented foods in that could help. So sauerkraut pickles, things like that. Um, but really it's just like the reason that people are calling the gut, the second brain is because we are recognizing how much of the body it controls. And that's really, really powerful. How important is having a healthy gut microbiota to someone in recovery from addiction? Yeah, I think very healthy, very healthy. Uh, I mean, very important because if you don't have a good microbiome, then you're going to um, fall back into some of those those same things that perhaps brought you to addiction to begin with. So, you know, not being able to manage stress, things of that nature, feeling like crap and wanting to get out of that state of, I feel like crap, I need something to get me to feel good again. Um, so I think it's really important, but I think at a high level, it's important because as you go through addiction and you go through recovery, um, and again, coming from someone who's not a mental health expert, I feel like you said it in the first line of this show, everything has to recover in order for you to keep that addiction from rearing its ugly head. So to get out of, out of an addiction treatment program, and then the second you pull out of the place, you go to McDonald's is like, wow, well now it's just like, talk about going back to bad habits, even though that bad habit might not be drugs or alcohol. Right, 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 right. So what kind of, uh, so I guess what's the goal for, for all, so all the things that you mentioned, all the types of foods, what's, what's the main goal or what's the benefit of eating those foods? And, and, I, well, and I think you, you, you mentioned it earlier. I mean, I think, I think of two things yeah. and I can either, well, I think of inflammation and I think yep. of brain fog. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like if we take, if we take brain fog to a, a greater degree, I think just generalize better mental health. 
Um, yeah. you know, when you when you're fueling better, you you're feeling better. And we have it's it's not just something that's like a kind of a nice thing to think of and say, oh yeah, that makes sense. We actually have data and science now over a decade's worth to really prove that. So I think from that perspective, um, those are some of the benefits. And then I think like from the patient perspective, that can be really overwhelming, right? So like, okay, here I am, I'm going to your treatment center, Tim, and okay, now I have to stop taking drugs or stop doing alcohol. I have to tap into what my childhood was like because I got to figure that out and the trauma and everything associated. And you want me to eat more vegetables too out of, out of your mind? I mean, I can't make all those changes, right? So I think like a baby steps approach for diet is really important. And just really the semantics of it, like, yeah, as we go through treatment, think about what it looks like once you're out of here. Once you get home, what do you want your fridge to look like? Because that's going to make a difference into your success and your ability to maintain good mental health status. And then take that baby steps from there. Right. I've had plenty of patients that will come to me and I'll, I'll say, what, you know, why are you here today? Why do you want to work with me? Oh, I really want to improve my eating habits and I want to live longer and I'm not giving up bacon. Great. Don't give up bacon then. That's fine. So let's not like kill ourselves for like what we have to give up. Let's look at what we can add and we can still keep some of those other things in. Why is it that someone might crave a bowl of ice cream or a piece of pie or a candy bar, but they don't crave a plate full of broccoli? Um, because of the hyper palatability of it. So we have something in the food industry called hyper palatable foods. And those are foods that do two things. They open up neurotransmitters that make us feel calm, that make us feel relaxed. That's number one. And they also hijack areas in the brain that make it impossible for our normal digestive enzymes to come out and say, you're done eating. So I often go back to I think about when I was a kid and watching Sesame Street and I would see the commercial with that guy with the lace potato chip bag. And I don't know if you remember that commercial, Tim, but the guy was a devil. <laughs> OK, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you can't you know, have just one and yeah. you can't have just one. So, you know, never would they run that campaign today because it's actually true. You can't yeah. have just one. Right. And so that's the thing. When you're eating things that are very hyper palatable, it's very difficult to stop either because your brain is hijacked into not getting those symbols of I'm full. You don't get that fullness response um, or you're feeling great during it. Right. So that's very different from broccoli. And so that's the physiological approach. If we look at the mental approach, I think I said this on your show last time. You know, I don't know about you, but when I fell off my bike as a kid, my mother never ran up to me and said, like, it's going to be OK. We're going to go inside. We're going to have a big bowl of broccoli. Right. No, <laughs> right. Like, right. I mean, so we yeah. when we look at kind of like where we have adapted as humans and our diet. It is not physiological. It is learned behavior. So we have learned at a very early age that when something bad happens, food will soothe it. And it's hard to get out of that mind frame. And so, again, we are offered certain things in childhood that make us happy, that reward us, whatever words you want to use. And so once we become adults, we seek out those same foods to get the same response that warmed our hearts when we were a child. So that's one of the reasons why broccoli, things like that, plants, they don't give you that, you know, that high, those, the high of serotonin and norepinephrine, I mean, they don't, and dopamine, they don't give you that. Some plants do, right? Like some lentils and things, but not to the impact that other processed foods can. Right. Broccoli is just nourishment. It's what your body needs, but it doesn't right. do anything. It doesn't give you a high. It doesn't make you amped up. Exactly. It doesn't like, it doesn't do anything. Right. And when you're not stressed, you're not your mind is not. Um, I really want to avoid getting heart disease 50 years from now. Your mind right. is feel good now. Yeah. Broccoli, broccoli ain't going to do it. Right. Is there a different type of a nutrition program for a person with an eating disorder versus a, an alcoholic or a drug addict in recovery? You know, I really I don't know much about eating disorders because eating disorders really are all mental health, um, not so much diet. I've had plenty of patients that have come to me and said, hey, my daughter, my son, I would really like them to come see you because I think they have an eating disorder and I don't see that patient. Um, 
you know, I would send them to the meadows. I would send them to places that have that expertise. I don't have that. Um, so it's hard for me to comment on that. Okay. Why do addicts early in recovery have sugar cravings? And, and I can say like myself, for example, when I first got clean and sober, I'm like, I'm eating cake, pie, ice cream, Jolly Ranchers. I mean, I gained like 20 pounds. Yeah. Right? But, you know, and, and so why, why is that? Yeah. Um, I think it is uh, replacing one addiction for another. That's probably the simplest way to look at it. And also looking at the fact that having things that are high in sugar do make you feel good. So that, that feeling doesn't last. Um, we've actually seen it as well. in, for example, uh, bariatric patients. So they go through bariatric surgery. They lose weight. They are no longer addicted to food and they become addicted to sex. Um, so we've seen addiction trading in some of these things because mm-hmm. now I can't eat food. I'm not allowed to. I can't feed that addiction. So I'm going to do it through another manner. Um, for whatever reason, sex pe- seems to be the one that um, we're seeing the highest percentages of as, as, lo- as well as seeing, you know, the latest amount of data. Um, so I think that's really what it boils down to. It's like, OK, like. Uh, you know, I can't have alcohol or I can't have a drug. And both those things made me just feel on top of the world. So what else is going to make me feel on top of the world that no one's going to yell at me for having? And that's a big bag of gummy bears. <laughs> right? right? Yeah. I mean, it's the, it's, where's the solution? Cause when someone's in pain, like when they're um, irritable, discontent, like what's going to, what's going to give me some fulfillment? What's going right. to make me feel better? What's going to give yeah, me some relief? Yep. Cake, pie, ice cream, candy, gambling, Facebook, right. Right. TikTok. Right. And I think it also, I mean, we, we, we see addictive properties in the data with sugar. We don't see addictive properties as much in salt, but I also think it's also where you lie. So for some people, um, the cake and the ice cream and all those things are going to be really critical to feeling good. But for other people, it is going to be that bag of potato chips. So it's, right. it, I think it's, it's kind of depends on, you know, are you more on the salt factor or are you more on the sweet factor? Where are you going to be? Like, is a baguette with butter going to make you feel better than a, a bag of gummy bears? For some people, the answer is absolutely yes. For me, it is. I'd much rather have the baguette with butter than the gummy bears. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, what's interesting is I moved from, I used to be a salt person. I, I would more want the chips or, or the um, the pizza or something like that, as opposed to the candy or the cake or the pie. But I've I've changed. I kind of like more sweets these days. Yeah, I've seen that as well. I've seen change on both on both axioms. I don't know what the mechanism is. My only thought process is at some point you probably had more of the other and that then mm-hmm. fueled the ability to want more and to crave more. Gotcha. What's uh, what about intermittent fasting? What's your opinion on intermittent fasting for a person in recovery? Yeah, I love intermittent fasting as long as that person in recovery is not also um, working through uh, disordered eating as well or right. diagnosed eating disorder. But for the for the person that doesn't have that as coming along with them uh, in recovery, I think that intermittent fasting is good. I think it taps into how we are supposed to eat as a species. Um, yeah. We are not supposed to eat around the clock, yet we do right. because we live in an environment where that is not only fostered but encouraged. So I think that um, there are so many studies on intermittent fasting that show benefit that it's hard to argue against, okay, let's just limit our eating hours to eight hours a day, right? I think we can all benefit from something like that. Right. Give your gut a rest. Right. And we don't. We eat around the clock, again, because we can and because it's Mm -hmm. encouraged. We're hit by marketing. When you go home today and you drive home, Count how many fast food restaurants you're going to pass. A lot. Right. Right. And even for someone who works out on a regular basis, they they say you should eat every every two hours or every three hours or something like that. And it's like what ends up happening is that you spend all your time eating or thinking about food. I mean, I think about food all the time. I, I can tell yeah. you. Yeah. And there was just a really interesting study that came out last week out of Duke, uh, really fascinating. And it really showed that um, our metabolism doesn't change from 20 to 60. Like we, we are all, and when I say we, I also am referring to me, 45 year old woman, like, yeah, it's my metabolism. That's why I don't yeah. fit into my wedding dress. I got married at 29. Come on. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, this study showed that it doesn't 
change at all between 20 and 60. And the other interesting component is not to say we shouldn't exercise. We should. Like there's so many cardiovascular benefits and mental health benefits. But to exercise for the goal of weight loss, this study and others that this author did show that it's not going to make any difference. None. Right. So, again, like what exercise does is it makes you more hungry. Exactly what you said. Right. Mm -hmm. Makes you more hungry. And a lot of my patient base, uh, it makes them more more willing to eat more like, yeah, I'll have that pizza. I ran five miles today. Right. Um, Uh And so they're still. okay, so they're still overfueling. Right. Yeah. So, again, they still haven't met that nice equilibrium. So I'm not, never what I say to someone, don't exercise. I love exercise, but don't count on exercise to be your key for weight loss and weight management. Right, 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 right. I can tell you, I used to think that I always needed to eat because I didn't want to lose weight. I don't want to get too skinny. And I think I need to eat all the time. And I've, I've realized, like, I don't need to eat all the time. And no. I started intermittent fasting. I stop eating three or four hours before I go to sleep at night. And I used to think that I needed to eat because I would wake up in the middle of the night, but I've learned to embrace being hungry. And I'll tell you, that's one of the best things I ever learned was to embrace being hungry. We don't need to eat all the time. No, I've got plenty of fuel. Food is fuel. I heard you say that the last time we spoke, right? Food is fuel. The last thing you need right before you go to bed is fuel, right? You're going to sleep. You're going to sleep and let's say you deplete your glycogen stores during sleep. You're not going to die. Your body's going to tap into fat. That's fuel number two that we'll go into. So I think like, yeah, from that perspective, it's like the body really is incredible and it goes through major metabolic adaptation for the sake of survival. So I think like when you're feeling hungry and you're about to go to sleep, it's just like, man, it's just not, I mean, you're not going to die during the night. Your body's going to keep you alive and, and all everything, <laughs> all the systems are still going to work, right? Yeah. Is there a question that you've always wanted to be asked, but the interviewer never got around to it? Um, let's see. Hmm. I think one of the questions that I don't get asked enough, but I get it asked not by interviewers, but constantly by my patients is what's the best diet out there? Right. Oh, there's so many diets. There's so much information and everyone, no one likes my answer. It's totally non-sexy. Um, but the best diet out there is the one that's nutrient dense, fits within your environment, what we just talked about, and one you can mm-hmm. stick to. And for, for everyone, that's going to be different. I have patients that hate intermittent fasting. I have patients that do awesome with keto. Others that say, oh, I can't sustain keto. So we go back to this measure of success, whether you're an alcoholic or you're a food addict and look at, okay, success is not measured within three months, right? So what diet can you stick to? To most people, if you look at the studies, it really just boils down to the basics, right? Eat more plants, listen to your hunger, intermittent fast, go back to the basics. And what I've heard you say in the past is eat whole foods, Eat whole foods, right? At least 90% of the time. A lot of clinicians will say, hey, make it an 80-20. I think people are better than that. I think you can go 90-10. Still have that Oreo if you want to have. Still have the ice cream if you want to have it. But if you're going to have ice cream, have real ice cream, right? And really enjoy it and don't feel shameful about it. Again, like part of changing how we look at food and nutrition is also related to part of how we look at changing our relationship with food. Right. Like food cannot be entertainment or the mental health that we're looking for or the drug. So once we change the semantics and once we really look at it as fuel, we'll be in a much better place. Right. Food. Food is fuel. That's it. Food is fuel. And and, I mean, and and when you go out to dinner with a bunch of friends, that's entertainment. Yeah. Right. And you're you're distracted when you go out to dinner. Right. Like think about how much we eat. And there's studies on this. Think about how much we eat out to dinner related to I am sitting alone at my kitchen table. Huge right. difference. So what's what's the definition of, of whole food or real food? Um, I still steal mine from Michael Pollan. I, he still has the best one out there. And he defines food as something that comes from nature, is fed from nature, and will eventually rot. That is food. So when you have your meat from that uh, pasture-raised, grass-finished cow, you are eating food. But if you go out to dinner tonight, Tim, and you get a cheeseburger that's factory made, 
right? Like it's coming from a CAFO lots and the cows are eating grain and they're not eating any grass. They're not eating from nature. Now you're no longer eating food. So I think that's the best definition of food because it takes us back to the most primal way of eating, right? Something that is coming from nature. So a plant or an animal, but fed from nature, I think is really critical. And obviously the eventually rot portion of it is really having to do with the fact that it's void of preservatives, additives, things like that. Right. Well, I think we're, we're coming up on the hour here and, and Kristen, I, I appreciate you so much and tell, uh, tell people where they can find you or how they can find you or how they can learn more about you. Yeah. Um, so you could go, so people could go to my Instagram page, which is fuel well with Chrissy. Okay. Instead of feel well, fuel well with Chrissy, um, or my website, which is just my name, Kristen Kirkpatrick.com and Kristen spelled with an I. Fuel well with Chrissy. Fuel well with Chrissy. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate you so much. You too. See you you next too. Time. <laughs> okay.